Okay, great. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm Scott Lehman, the Mixed Reality Lead for Soprasteria, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the past, the present, and the future of Mixed Reality. So looking at the history of Mixed Reality first, uh, Mixed Reality is this spectrum between the real world, the physical world, and the digital world. So on one side you've got virtual reality, where you're immersed in a digital world and largely cut off from the real world. And that's great for things like training and entertainment and art. And then on the other side, you've got augmented reality, where you're focused on the real world, but you're augmenting reality, adding digital objects into the real world. So you can do that with your phone. But you can also do that with wearable AR headsets, like the HoloLens 2. And this is what the HoloLens 2 is built for. It's meant to be a device that you can wear in the real world, uh, in work locations for enterprise use, and see digital objects, holograms in the real world, and use your hands, your voice, and your eyes to control those objects, and do training and learn more about what's going on in the real world. This is one use case we work with at Soprasteria as part of Holocare, uh, and this is where we take specific patient data uh, and visualize it as a 3D hologram for surgical planning. So multiple surgeons can look at the same 3D hologram of a patient's heart, in this case, and look at the problem that they need to solve and have a, a spatial conversation together to say, okay, perhaps there's a hole in this heart that needs to be repaired. How are we going to approach that in the safest way possible? And have a conversation as if uh, that heart was really in the, in the room with them. So how did we get to here? Uh, it started in the 60s with uh, the sens uh, <laughs> Sensorama, which is kind of a, a precursor to virtual reality. This was a one-person device where you'd stick your, your head in a box and you'd see a stereo film uh, of different experiences, like a motorcycle ride. And you'd also feel the vibrations of the motorcycle and smell the smells uh, and feel wind in your face. So this was an attempt to immerse people uh, beyond what was possible at that time. And then also in the 60s, you had the Sword of Damocles, which was a ceiling-mounted uh, virtual reality display. Uh, it was actually transparent, the display, so it was a little bit augmented reality. And so this allowed you to see wireframe forms, uh, and it had head tracking. So as you moved your head around the room, you'd see this 3D wireframe shape from different angles. And then in the 80s, the technology started to be commercialized for, for enterprise, companies like VPL, uh, and NASA, NASA started using VR for training. And then in the 90s, there was a push to try and bring VR into consumers with VR arcades and um, some, some failed VR consumer products. And then in the, the 2010s, uh, due to the uh, smartphones basically and the technology around displays and tracking for smartphones, we had the Oculus Rift as a Kickstarter. Uh, and then soon after the success of that, a number of companies started making commercial VR headsets like the Oculus CV1, the HTC Vive, PlayStation VR. Uh, and also in the 2010s, we had the Pokemon Go from on, uh, as well as people started selling wearable AR headsets, like the HoloLens 1 for enterprise use, uh, the Magic Leap 2, which was one of the first consumer wearable AR headsets. It was a commercial failure. Uh, and the HoloLens 2. And also, we started to see standalone VR headsets, headsets that didn't rely on an external computer. So right now, <coughs> the HoloLens 2 is still around. It's still one of the leading enterprise wearable AR headsets. But last year, uh, it gained some competition with the Magic Leap 2. This is a similar device, a wearable AR device with transparent lenses. This is a little bit different form factor in that all the computing and the battery is on your belt instead of being on your head. So it's a different form factor, and it's got a physical controller that you can, um, you can hold as well instead of just relying on, on hand tracking. And this is an example demo application um, that I'm running in my, in my living room, and this is showing the effect of wildfires around the world and how they can be managed. So you can see the real world, but you're seeing these uh, digital objects embedded in the real world, and you can interact with them using that hand controller. And one of the more interesting things uh, about the Magic Leap 2 is it has this functionality of global dimming. So with the transparent display, you can determine how much of the real world do you want to see. You can turn, turn that from 0 to 100%. And at 100%, it's almost blocking out uh, all the light. So it's a VR-like experience at 100%. So you can kind of determine how much of an augmented reality or virtuality-like uh, experience you want, if you want to prioritize the real world or prioritize the digital information. 
Also coming out last year was the MetaQuest Pro. Uh, this is a high-end standalone VR headset, uh, uh, kind of a successor to the uh, MetaQuest 2. And one interesting thing about this device is that it has color stereo cam uh, cameras on the outside, so you can see the real world uh, via those cameras uh, in a technique called pass-through AR. So you're, you're not seeing the uh, real world directly via our transparent display, but you're seeing it by these cameras, which are showing it on your screens. And so you can have this digital content embedded in the real world uh, in the same fashion using this VR headset. In terms of development for mixed reality, um, your two main options, or the two most popular options, are the Unity or Unreal game engines. Uh, if you're working with uh, Unity, the Mixed Reality Toolkit, uh, which is supported for HoloLens and Magic Leap 2, as well as some VR headsets, uh, can be a good, uh, a good way to start. It was developed by Microsoft, and they had a full-time team originally. There's recently been uh, let go, so now it's been released into the community. So we'll have to see if that keeps developing. Um, but also, if you're using Unity, the XR Interaction Toolkit and AR Foundation are great to get you started as well. In terms of services for mixed reality, um, there's a number of, of companies that will offer visual positioning systems, basically systems that allow you to generate a 3D fingerprint of the world and then anchor content to that position in the world. Um, so Microsoft has got a service called Azure Spatial Anchors that does that. Uh, and Microsoft also offers uh, Azure Object Anchors, where you can upload a 3D model of a real object and then match against that. And uh, Azure Remote Rendering, where you can take a really complex 3D model and stream uh, a rendering of that to the whole lens too, so you don't have to worry about the complexity uh, of the model. Looking at the future of mixed reality, <coughs> in less than two weeks, uh, Apple has got the Worldwide Developer Conference on the 5th of June, and there's a lot of rumors that they'll be announcing a, a virtual reality device uh, for that event. And it's interesting because like the MetaQuest Pro, it's rumored to have multiple cameras on the outside so that you can do pass-through AR. Um, so it'd be a high-end VR device. It's rumored to be around maybe $3,000. Um, that also allows you to do uh, augmented reality via that device. Uh, and it's rumored not to have a traditional VR controller, but to uh, use hand tracking and possibly a wearable hand controller as well. And that's interesting because uh, if it's successful, it could be a lot of people's first experiences uh, with wearable AR uh, experiences for consumers in the living room or in the office. Um, and it's also interesting that Apple seems to be not focusing on gaming so much, which has been a big focus of, of virtuality for, for Meta and Valve and other companies. So it could begin to push virtuality and mixed reality um, beyond the scope of gaming into a more general spatial computing use case. Another interesting recent development is uh, NERFs, Neural Radiance Fields. And this is a machine learning process where you, uh, you supply a number of images, still photos or videos, and it's able to generate a 3D scene um, from those images. And this is different to photogrammetry, which is where you give a bunch of images and it creates a 3D model. This isn't creating a 3D model. It's creating a, a simulation of what a particular camera viewpoint would see. So there's no 3D model there, per se. This is a, a nerf that one of my colleagues, Yelmer, on the Mixed Reality team made uh, recently. So he recorded a video, and he fed it into the, uh, the machine learning algorithm, and this is what it generated, a kind of drone flyby um, of that scene. And so this can be a very interesting way to generate content for VR and AR in the future. And talking more broadly, uh, mixed reality is dependent on all the technologies that we use to understand the real world. So sensors and machine learning, when you use these devices and you use your voice, you're using AI to understand what you want. Uh, we're using machine learning to train the hand tracking algorithms that allow you to reach out and interact with holograms using your hands. And more, <coughs> as more and more machine learning develops that allows us to understand the context of how we're using this device, what's going on in the room, what are the objects, what are the spaces like, as well as what you intend to do, what you want. Uh, the use cases for mixed reality will develop. Um, one of the rumors for the, the Apple device uh, is that you might be able to use Siri in order to generate, uh, through procedural generation, spaces or digital objects in your space. So you might be able to have a conversation with the device 
to redecorate your apartment, for example. Thank you. I hope that's been an interesting look at uh, the past and potential future of mixed reality.